this evening, I wanted to do Plato's talk on wisdom, <clears throat> which is the exploration of the dialectic. And since I left out a section on our last talk on Carl Jung on the same subject, I thought I'd quickly pull in Carl Jung and move to Plato. So this is a curious intellectual journey we're going to embark on. So let me first take a look at Carl Jung's. Um, now everything I have here, of course, comes from Carl Jung's two works, The Principles and Practices of Psychotherapy and Alchemy and Psychology. Now, major psychotherapy is, for Carl Jung, a dialectical process. That's what he says. So we must try to understand this idea of a dialectical process. It's a procedure. He says it's where the doctor participates as much as the patient. It's a question and answer exploration. He has a couple of rules, however, which distinguish what he's doing from the Platonic tradition and of course, including Plato. And that is never to go beyond the meaning which is effective for the patient. It's the dialectical procedure involves a reciprocal relationship between two people. He sees it as a, one psychic system engaging in another. What guides him? He says, I have one, he says, I really have two basic notions. One is the the psyche has an intimate relationship with the body, the body equally to, to the psyche. And that allows him then to use the same language when he says, uh, the individual is nothing in comparison with the universal, and the universal is nothing in comparison with the individual. And therefore, one without the other is missing. It's a relationship, a reciprocal relationship that's essential to both. Now, what is this dialectical procedure? He says, when you enter into it, as far as the physician is concerned or the psychotherapist, they must give up all superior knowledge, all claims to superior knowledge and authority. Right? It has to be a comparison of mutual findings. It's a different kind of exploration. It's not being guided by a method. It's a comparison of what you find and what I find, and they talk about it. He says he has to give up the hat. He has to give up the image of authority to play this game with the patient. Because as far as the individual is concerned, the individual is unique, uninterpretable. Well then, how do you get involved in this kind of dialectical exploration? Not everybody that goes into Carl Jung's treatment gets it. He said, normally, he said, I'm more willing to send people to this specialist and this specialist. If someone has a religious bent to their nature, I'm quite willing to send them there. He said, the people that are involved in this curious dialectical procedure are those that were stuck in treatment where he says, we tend to go over the same thing. Repetition is the theme. And it is monotonous, he says. Hey, you know, it's very monotonous. We're stuck. He says, therefore, what am I going to do? He says, oh, so there's only one thing I can do. <laughs> Try the dialectical procedure. That's a decision you have to make. This, for him, is a major shift in the development of psychotherapy. He calls it the latest phase of development it's a complete abandonment of all past systems and methods. It's completely different. By the way, the essay this comes out of is dated 1935. Well, what is it you're doing in this dialectical procedure? He said, the first thing you have to do is you treat symbols that people have anagogically. Now, that's a fancy word, important word, for taking things on the highest level. You don't reduce them to Freudian concepts. You don't even reduce it to Jungian concepts. 
you take it on the highest level possible because that brings about the process of individuation where the individual embarks on a process of inner development leading to a knowledge and an awareness of the nature of the self on the highest level. Now these kinds of symbols that he engages in, they have multiple significance. That is, you can take one symbol and you can explore it in many, many, many different ways at great depth. Therefore, how do you proceed with this? He says, well, what you have to do is you have to see that this is simply a question and answer game. Both parties play it. If someone has a symbol that comes in a dream or in a discussion, then you then must explore it on multiple levels. You have to allow the other party as much freedom as you allow yourself. But it, engage, it entails a risk. He says, this is a risk because everything may be fall into question. You may question everything the person thinks and brought to it. And he said, we have to be aware of the fact that there are limits. There are limits to it. Of course, it's no point going beyond the needs of the patient. But yet, you're trying to get involved in an individuation process, which is a goal, knowing, gaining an insight into the very nature of yourself. Well, he says, I'll tell you how I proceed from my experience. He said, I proceed with the patient rather as if I had the dream myself. And I'm in a position to supply the content that's what he does. Now, why does he use dreams? He says, because when I'm stuck and the patient is going over the same material over and over again, repetitious and monotonous, I'm stuck too. I don't know where else to go. He says, I do not know where else to go for help, so I try to find it in dreams. In the dialectical procedure, the unconscious produces certain images of the goal. It naturally does it once you start exploring the goals of the patient and you treat them in this way. Then a whole set of images emerge from the unconscious. And these are basic images have great value. This is, of course, the mandala and the quadraternity. And it's on this basis that the analysis then can proceed dialectically. That's what he means by dialectic. What does he mean then by it? Well, you got a patient who's stuck in treatment, going over the same material many times. Then he has to make a decision. The decision he makes is because he's stuck. He has to see whether the patient can risk it. Everything must fall into question. He has no other way to go, so he goes to dreams. Dreams bring up the symbols. The symbols then are explored in question and answer, where he gives up his authority and talks to the patient one-on-one. -on -one. He then has to abandon any kind of method, even his own, and this complete abandonment of all past systems is for him the dialectical procedure. So that's a major shift in the whole development of psychotherapy. Now, what's interesting, of course, about this system of Carl Jung's, um, he says there are um, situations where uh, a patient um, where a patient gives up. He said, you know, the analysis can terminate for a wide number of reasons. And um, I was going to read them to you, but I, I'm pretty, pretty clear about them. He said, even though you're engaged in a dialectical exploration and the person is involved in the process, this dialectical treatment can break down. He said, not only may it break down, it has a natural end. It can end. It can end. Uh, the individual may realize that they've gone as far as they want and they don't want to go any further. They've been able to resolve some certain kinds of problems they have and they don't really want to go on to get an insight into the nature of the self. They may end up with a new choice in career. Uh, they, they may find something new has happened in their life that's significant. 
Any things in life may cause it, but the ninth reason he gives us, of course, is the one I love. He says, you know the reason why some of these people drop out? He says, they go into philosophy. <laughs> This really raises the question, you see, you see, he doesn't know where he's going, he's stuck, so he goes to dreams, that's fine. But he doesn't have the very thing that he needs to explore it in depth. And he, from the last talk we gave, remember, he, there's plenty of places where he sees he should go into philosophy. So let's take a look at what, in contrast, what Plato is doing. Here we have something quite different, of course. We have the dialectic is in many, many, as a matter of fact, it's often said that every part of Plato's dialogue shows a dialectic. But I want to use it very strictly tonight in terms of Plato's Republic. So the dialectic in Plato's Republic. Now, in order to get to the dialectic, Plato has to talk about four things have to be in place before it makes any sense. And the first thing he talks about is what he calls the perfect model of the good. Now, here is the sun. Here is light. As a result of that life which flows, then you are then able to see objects. They now are visible. Now, as he explores this, as he explores this, he says, exactly like this is the good, or the one, highest goal. Light, he says, that's divine radiance divine radiance or luminosity. Now, this divine radiance or luminosity is also called the, as we know, the idea of the good. Because the word idea is a Greek word. That is a Greek word, idea, that's a Greek word. It means to behold. To behold the good is an experience, is a vision. All right, therefore, I said, look here, we have a soul. And in a similar way, he said, there must be something from the good which allows us, therefore, to know. And the things that you know in that, what he says, when the soul when the soul rests in this realm of divine luminosity, it knows, gains knowledge and truth. And it then can appear to have intellect. But some translators use the word reason, but that's a poor word. It's really the idea of noose or noetic. It's that part of the mind which is capable of uh, gaining a vision of ultimate reality. So then over here, he says, look here, there are two kinds of light, of course. He said, uh, they're luminaries of night, the moon, the stars, and in that sense, there's also the sun itself. And in each of these realms, uh, just for the symmetry, let me turn that around. Here, when the eyes, therefore, when you find yourself in the, at night, when only the moon and the stars are present, it appears, therefore, that you don't have any sight in the eyes, and it looks, in, it looks therefore, that you can only see and perceive objects dimly, but once you're in the light of the sun, then you can perceive clearly, and it appears to be that you have power in the sight in your eyes, even though the eyes have been functioning all along. He says, without this light, this performs a very, what he calls a magnificent bond, because even though there's sight in the eyes, 
the sight is able to see, and colors in the object, and therefore it's among visible things. Without this third thing, there can be no perception. Without this third thing. Same way over here. Even though the soul has an eye to see, unless it's turned towards that which then makes these things visible, that is to say, knowable, therefore one gains as a consequence knowledge and truth. But that's only if you can find yourself in this realm, just like you can only see if you're in this realm, that realm permeated by light. Now, this is a, there are, if we went through this carefully, there are 14 points he makes here. For each one of them, we can make an, another set over here. It's done very systematically. But I just want to uh, cover tonight, uh, because you can go back and you can do it yourself. This allows Socrates, therefore, to say what we need to see in this is uh, the way in which four cognitive functions relate to this. This is like image thinking. This is like the realm of belief. All right? And he says, these four cognitive functions, these are functions of the mind because we want to study now the mind. That's where we're going. So he takes this part from the story we just explored. And he says, what we must do is to see how the mind functions. The mind functions, therefore, through four stages. Image thinking, being impressed only by images, beliefs, right? understanding, and knowing. These are the ways in which the mind functions. He says, these two gain their source from the visible world. If you turn your mind to the visible world, then you will see, right? And any statement, any statement made about the visible world, that is the world of generation where things come and go, right? That realm is called the realm of generation, and all statements made about it is what he calls opinion. That's the realm of opinion. Any statement dealing with any sense perception or entails sense perception, ha, ah, opinion. Ah, nice piece of chalk. Chalk, perceptible, opinion. He's over here, all right? There's another kind of knowledge and experience, and therefore, he says, the next thing which you have to grasp is understanding, and understanding and knowing. These two are like this is the intelligible. And this is the invisible. So if you want to grasp the intelligible, he says you have to shift the psyche and all of its concerns from the realm of opinion. You have to turn, as it were, the interest from here to here. That's the goal. Well, what would that be like? What kind of a nature do you have? Oh, look here, he says, I'll tell you what it's like. He said, uh, I have to give you a story of the allegory of the cave in the upper world. And so he has an allegory of the cave, which you're undoubtedly all familiar with, a group of men who are chained and fettered in such a way as they can only see the wall of the cave in front of them. And the wall in the cave has dancing shadows passing across it because there's a wall behind them where men are carrying objects on their head and a fire behind it. And this fire behind it allows, therefore, images to be uh, projected on the wall of the cave. They're there since childhood, and they take that to be their total and permanent reality. And that is the way they spend their lives. They're chained and fettered there, so they can't turn their head either way, and they can't get out. He says, now this is man's condition. Look here. Here we have, they believe, they believe this is their reality. 
the thing, if, if they accept these images on the wall of the cave as real, they're image thinkers. The things that these men carry back and forth across the wall, this walkway, he said, these objects are man-made beliefs. These are the beliefs that people have. Taught to them since their youth. Taught to them about gods, about society, about man. And therefore, these people believe these images of these things. And if they do, they are image thinkers and they're stuck in a cave. He said, hey, you know what? What you have to do is you have to see what it would be like if we could get one of these people and force him to stand up and by questions and answers get him to see what's going on. And if you can do that, you can then perhaps force him up into the upper world. And when he gets up into the upper world, the brilliance, divine luminosity, will be so intense that it will be unbearable. He won't be able to adjust to it. So therefore what you do is you allow him to get up there and experience all these things at night. So all he sees is the luminaries of night. But that furnishes visibility on a low scale, but enough for him now to study things up here in the upper world in shiny surfaces, just like this. Same dynamics, just like this in the upper world. So now he can study God-made things in reflections, getting used to those things. And once he's used to that, then he can move over here and see things in their true reality the way they really are. Ah, understanding, knowledge. Allegory of the cave in the upper world. You see, I'm picking up a lot of the images we used before. Good. Now, how do you do this? How do you make this ascent? How do you make this ascent? That's the problem. Oh, he says, oh, I'll tell you how you make that ascent. He says, oh, the ascent is very, very, very important. This ascent, this ascent, this ascent must be the training of those seeking to gain a vision of the nature of reality and the good. This is the training of what he calls the philosopher kings. Now, you can take Plato and you can take these studies he calls the classics, or some people call them the classic studies. They're arithmetic, geometry, uh, astronomy, harmony. He has solid geometry in here, but he, it, uh, it's too, he says it's very difficult to get people to study that because of uh, the difficult to get teachers and difficult to get students who really want to study it. Now, you can take these studies. In order to get into Plato is really quite simple. All you have to see is two things. There is an everyday understanding of these things. There's an everyday uh, grasp, I don't want to use the word understanding, grasp of these studies. And he gives examples of them. He says, oh, imagine a general not being able to count his troops, so he, he would th therefore would have no way of knowing how many troops he has and how many divisions he has and how many segments in each. He said it would be a terrible uh, catastrophe if we didn't have that kind of earth. That's the practical. This whole, this whole thing is the practical way of understanding these studies. There's a philosophical side to these studies. that when we go into it, which is what we're now going to go into, and why are we going to go into it? Because 
when you're able to see the kinship between these, the kinship and community of these, the way they interrelate to one another, that's the step that allows you to pass into the study of the dialectic. That's the passageway. You have to see how these interrelate into one another so that they form a natural com community. All right, now what are they? And how can arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and harmony have anything to do with what we're talking about? Well, all right, we're not going to go into the practical. We're going to use all of this comes out of Plato. These are all quotes. Everything I do is quotes. All right, so let's take a look. Let's say we can uh, talk about something else. Say, so would you agree that no matter what I focus on or you focus on, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's always a one. It's always a one. Whatever I perceive, even ideas, each one I distinguish as one. When I see ideas together and I see their unity, that becomes a higher one. All I'm doing is perceiving and dealing with ones. Then what is the oneness that runs through it all? And what is the nature of the one in itself? All right, after all, what is the nature of the one just as it is, as such? apart from the way in which we see particular things as one. Look, what happens when you make a group of people into a one? You can bring in a small group of people together and with proper training, they can become a choir, they can become a quartet, they can become a drill team, they suddenly gain something that not, none of them particularly have in its entirety, but are brought together into a higher unity and that allows them to function on a much more interesting and profound level. What does it? Oneness. They all have to realize that they have to be a one in respect to the oneness they're developing, and that suddenly allows a greater kind of entity to come into existence. What is that one? The whole universe is one, one universe. Intelligence, taking it as an entirety, it's one. Well, what is the one just as it is? Well, okay. Oh, by the way, I'd like to shift. I'd like to shift now. Had enough of that. Say, so, remember we talked about the divine luminosity, radiance, the most brilliant light of being? Well, let's take a look at that, all right? Being, capital B. Divine luminosity. All right, divine luminosity being. Sometimes called the most brilliant light of being. Now, that is something that always is. It always is. It's eternal. It's something that always is. Now, if you could get true knowledge of that, then you'd have true knowledge of what is said to be eternally existent. And in that interesting perception and experience, you'd also grasp the nature of truth. If you were to do that, what would you then gain? You would gain, the Plato calls, the idea of the good. Capital I again. That's what this is, idea of the good. <laughs> what kind of study is that? Well, it's a kind of study that for Plato, it's absolutely imperative that we must see it. We must engage in the kinds of pursuits so that the soul is compelled to contemplate essence with a view towards truth itself. Now, we added another word here, essence. This stuff, being itself, divine luminosity, has a natural, has a natural function of turning upon itself and knowing itself. This aspect of being that can turn upon itself and know itself, that's the word essence what we call usia. So therefore, it's going to follow that if it's imperative for you to see it, then there's something in the soul that we must awaken so that it is compelled to contemplate this because when you get it, when you perceive it, that's what truth is. That's what truth is. There we are. That's what truth is. Oh, <laughs> by the way, 
This is what he calls arithmetic. Everything I did here, he calls this geometry. It's not the kind of geometry I studied. It's not the kind of arithmetic you studied. Remember what we said? There are two ways in which he can talk about this. A practical everyday sense and the philosophical. And they're so different. They are so different that unless you read it carefully, you'll miss this side of it. But that's where we're going, you see, on this side of it, the philosophical side. Well then, what's astronomy going to be? It's going to be just as strange as geometry was. He said, hey, the study of astronomy, it's the same as, the, it, we're going to do that the same way we studied geometry. Well then, what's the uh, way you study astronomy? Well, the whole goal of astronomy is to convert to convert to right use the natural indwelling intelligence of the soul. You got to turn it around to see this. You got to turn it around. You got to compel it. Therefore, you know what? That's what he says it is. Well, once you see it, then you can talk about real growth, real speed, and real slowness. And then he has this expression. Notice the way in which this language is. Um, we should really one time go into the study of numbers and what they mean by numbers and figures. Because when they're talking about number books, all what they mean as books of analogy or proportion. Formal books, five, seven, ten in, in Euclid. The number books. If you're studying them, you're studying all the properties of analogy. Everything we've been doing tonight and everything you do in Plato is analogies. Therefore, the formal study of it, that's what you get. What does that do? It turns the soul around so that then when you're playing with these things continuously, it then allows something to spark in the soul and turn it around. Well, if that's geometry, then what's astronomy? He said, oh, astronomy exactly corresponds to that of astronomy. Really? It exactly corresponds to it? Yeah, he says, yeah. What do you have to do? You study generalized problems, and then what you're going to do is when you get into this field, what you're really going to do is see how they, in what way, in which way, see, which numbers are inherently concordant, and which are those, and why are they? Which and why? So in studying this, then, you have to discover which are concordant and why they're concordant. And you're going to do that exactly. It's going to correspond exactly to that of astronomy. Therefore, it's going to convert the soul to turn around so the natural intelligence of the soul then is able, then, to prepare you for vision. Well, look here. And then harmony, okay? Now, look here. You must now see the way they interrelate. You have to see their communion, or what he says, their community and kinship. Have to see their kinship. Well, they're all dealing with the soul. That's their kinship. You have to see how they interrelate that way. Ah, well, when you do that, then you're entering into the dialectic. Now we can get into the dialectic. So, yeah. Now he has two terms. He calls it a prelude, a prelude and a melody for the dialectic. Now, what is so important about the dialectic and why is it there? Well, remember we talked about this at an earlier talk, but the essential thing is that people may in fact gain this magnificently beautiful vision 
uh, that splendid vision of the nature of ultimate reality and see it as divine luminosity and they may think that's the last step. In, in the Republic he says, you know what we have to make sure of? That people that we develop in our society, in our ideal society, don't get in this and stay in this because they think they're in the islands of the blessed. They have to go beyond this. There's something higher than these kinds of mystical visions. There's something beyond it. The only way for Plato that you can see that that is not an ultimate, the highest step, is through the dialectic. That's the goal of the dialectic. It's the only reason for the dialectic. Uh, and this highest sense. Right? Now, he said to do it, it presupposes that you have the studies as helpmates. And he has a, a very interesting pr uh, expression. He says you have to have a clear waking vision. That's what you need, a clear waking vision. Because you don't, see this is not a clear waking vision. Right? This is what you need, a clear waking vision. And he said, you won't have a clear waking vision unless you can see how all of these studies themselves interrelate and prepare, prepare the soul for this step to go from here to what is called the good or the one itself. That's the dialectic. Now, I'm going to read you just a short section from the prelude and then from the melody. And you'll see from the section that I'm going to read that he is going to go back through what we've said before, <clears throat> not on this page. going to go through this. He's going to go through this. When he talks about the prelude, and he's talking about it in the way of the melody in order to make this point, and then he's going to show the method of how he reaches it, or how he thinks we should reach it with the dialectic. And that's where we're going. Now, What, do you, what then will, will you not call this progress of thought dialectical? Surely. And what is it? Now, notice now we're going into the allegory of the cave. The release from the bonds, fetters. The conversion from the shadows to the images that cast them to the light, the ascent from the subterranean cavern to the world above, and their persisting a persistent inability to look directly at, at living things, animals and plants, and the light of the sun, but the ability to see the phantoms created by God in water and the shadows of objects that are real, but not, not merely as before shadows of images cast through a light, which compared to the sun is as unreal as they. All this procedure of the arts and the sciences we have described indicates their power to lead the best part of the soul up to the contemplation of that which is best among realities. That's what's best among realities. As in our parable, the clearest organ in the body was turned to the contemplation of that which is the brightest in the corporeal and vision visible region. Remember, that's what we did with the model of the good, the visible versus the invisible. All right, I accept this. He says, well then, okay, now look here. You've heard this often, and we're to repeat it hereafter. He says, let us assume that these things are now as has been said. So he's just gone through this. He's pulled elements from here, pulled elements of there, pulled elements from here. He says, all right, now, he says, now that we've done that, he said, 
and to go through with it as we've gone through the, the prelude, see? And now we must proceed to the melody itself and to go through with it as we have gone through the prelude. This is all the prelude to the dialectic. Nothing else than the power of the dialectic could reveal this. And that only to one experienced in the studies that we have described, and that, uh, let, me, let me go back. And may we not also declare that nothing less than the power of dialectic could reveal this, and only to one experienced in the studies we have described, and that the thing is in no other wise possible. There is no other inquiry that attempts systematically in all cases to determine what each is, each of the studies and each of the things we just put on the board, knowledge, understanding, belief, and image thinking. Now he's going to go back and tell us what's wrong with the studies. They're incomplete. But all the other arts have for their object opinions and desires of men. They're wholly concerned with generation and composition or with service. While the remnant which we said in some sort of way lay hold of reality, geometry and the studies that accompany it, are as we see they're dreaming about being but the clear waking vision of it is impossible for, for them as long as they leave the assumptions which they employ undisturbed and cannot give an account of them. For where the starting point is something that the reasoner does not know and the conclusion and all that intervenes right, is a tissue of things not really known, what possibility is there that that ascent in such cases can ever be converted into true knowledge or science? Dialectic is the only process of inquiry that advances in this method, in this manner. Doing away with hypothesis up to the first principle in order to find confirmation there. Dialectic gent gently draws it forth and leads it up, employing as helpers and co-helpers in this conversion the studies we have enumerated and the understanding. Now, All right. The man of the dialectician, therefore, must be able to give an exact account of the essence of each. All right. Remember what we meant by essence, the conversion, the con turning about. Um, and will you not say the one who is unable to do this, insofar as he is incapable of rendering an account to himself and to others, does not possess full uh, intelligence about this matter? And is not this true of the good likewise? The man who is unable to define in his discourse and distinguish and abstract from all other things the idea of the good and who cannot, as it were, in battle run the whole gauntlet of tests, striving to examine everything by usia, by, the na the na by, by uh, uh, essential reality, and not by opinion. Right? The man who lacks this power, you'll say, he doesn't know the good or anything else that's good. Okay, what do you have to do then? What is it? All right. We have this background, all the studies behind us. Therefore, we know then that this person has explored the nature of the one. Right? We know then that the process of the study has caused them to turn about and direct their whole mind on the nature of being, that's being. And therefore, they're able to grasp in some way this experience. Right? See, now we can go back and pull it together. Right? And he can now convert to right use the natural indwelling intelligence. He can now use the intelligence. What's interesting in this whole system is that you do not have intellect. Now that's a, using the word with a capital I. You do not have noose, intellect, until you participate in the divine and then you participate in. You participate in intellect. You do not have it. This allows you to participate in it. Now, this, of course, is just, uh, uh, I didn't do this right. Oh! 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Just to make sure, I want to make my terms right. As in the study of geometry, this is astronomy. Right? And exactly corresponds to that in astronomy, this is harmony, just to make sure we get the right name on it. All right. Okay. Now, therefore, in order to now do that, it means, therefore, with helpers as uh, helpmates, let's do it. Okay. In the divided line, these are the four major concepts. That's what we said before, right? Okay. All of our thinking and everything we're going to go through should in no way bring us into this realm, the realm of opinion, sense perception. We should stay entirely with this. What is wrong? What is the weakness in this state? You are making certain assumptions. You are making certain assumptions. That's the problem with that state. Uh, you're, one, you're assuming that's ultimate. Right? You're assuming, therefore, that since there is nothing higher, that uh, the person has reached the apex of human development. You realize, therefore, in experiencing the nature of being, that you participate, you participate in being. And to that degree, there's something kin between the very soul of man and that realm. There must be some likeness in it. Therefore, that allows the participation. Participation means, as this moves and participates in this, there must be something common between the two. That's participation. Now, in that state, it's not possible, it is not possible to imagine, to imagine in any way that there's anything higher. It's impossible to imagine anything higher, more beautiful, more real. These are the assumptions, these are the assumptions from that experience. By the way, wouldn't you agree then, the person with this experience would have to say, the experience itself was blissful, bliss, they reached being, they reach the nature of reality. They know the experience is a magnificent, beautiful experience where they see beauty itself. And that they cannot in any way can see it in any way as less than ultimate. That's where they're at. Now, um, would you not agree that the thing that runs through this study is this curious question, what, after all, is the one? The one in itself. Um, would you not agree that um, anything that's a whole must have parts? Well, would you agree, if we mean by one, one, at least one thing we have to be sure about, and that is that we do not mean many. That's the least thing we can say, can't we? If we mean by one, we don't mean many. Oh, by the way, then anything that's a whole must have parts, must it not? And if they have parts, that would be a many. Therefore, this one we're talking about can certainly not be a many. Uh-oh. Is this, what do we mean by a many? When we can assign predicates to something, 
when we can assign qualities to a thing, plural, right? One, two, three, four, these are different. You know, it's four qualities. Well, it can't be a one. Well, it can't be a one in itself. By the way, in this experience, there's no boundary. There's no boundary. It's limitless. Unlimited. Oh, by the way, this idea of one, uh, if anything we call it a one, if it has a beginning and middle and end, they would be respectively the parts of it. So therefore, it too must be unlimited. Ooh, ooh. Oh, but wait a minute. Even though it's unlimited, it is what it is. I mean, it, it is well defined, it is something, and in respect insofar as it is something that we can define, it has a limit, being what it is. So then this has both limited and unlimited. And that's a plural. So anything that has a beginning, middle, and end, like this, must have a form to it, must it not? Uh, because everything that has a form is made up of straight lines and circles, is it not? Because you can take any, any irregular figure and find some circumference of a circle that would be able to identify that curve, and therefore everything is made up of straight lines and curves, and therefore they're made up of straight lines and circles. Oh, therefore if it has a beginning, middle, and end, it must have a form. That's a form that must be composed of straight lines and circles. If it's made up of straight lines and circles, then we would have a limit, a very interesting limit. And in that limit, there would be parts of it, because we could distinguish the parts inside, outside, around it, between it. Oh, that would be a many. That can't be a one. Oh, well, wait a minute. Is there any sense in which you can say this was alive? Was this in any sense dead? Or was, oh yes, it was alive. Vitality, vitality. Oh, vitality, what does that mean, vitality? Well, that means in some sense, in some sense, uh, the person who experienced it must be aware of some kind of motion, some kind of vitality, some kind of change. Oh, <laughs> if there's any kind of change, it, it must be different at some point from another. Or if it stays where it is, it must go through, it must allow itself to be permeated or to be participated by various degrees. Does that experience admit of degrees? Yes, it does admit of degrees. Oh, it admits of degrees. Then if it admits of degrees, that means, oh, that means there must be stages in it. Stages in it, plural. It's not the one. Not the one then, right? We only want to talk about a one, not a, something with a bunch of stages in it. We want a pure one. So therefore, it can't be in motion, can't have any vitality. All right. Well, if it's not in motion, by the way, it can't be at rest either because it has to stay where it is for as long as it is. But that means to stay where it is as long as it is suggests there must be some place in which it is, and that's two, so it can't. <laughs> that's what this is, of course it is, but it can't be the one because that already suggests a two-ness. So therefore, if we do have the idea of the one, it can't be, a, the idea of the one doesn't admit of this. Oh, by the way, wouldn't you agree that all of these things must come together into some unity? Say, if being, reality, beauty, vitality, all come together as a unity in a unified experience, would you not agree in order for a unity to exist that presupposes there must be some prior condition called oneness? I mean, anything that's the condition for something is before it, is prior to it. And oneness presupposes there must be one. Well, then the idea that one is prior to the idea of oneness, unity, and therefore, by the way, the condition for this, there must be a condition for it, and the thing that's conditioned for it is always superior to the thing. Oh, so the one must be therefore superior to the thing that has a, a unity. Yeah, because it presupposes a one, a one, not the one. Oh. Oh, wow, then. If that, look here, if that's the case, then this obviously must be an object of experience. This can't be an object of experience. 
Well, then we're, we're talking about something that it's not an object of experience that we're saying is higher than experience. What is that? And can that be in any way apprehended? I mean, what does that do to the human mind? Oh, it allows you to see there's something beyond this that might itself, that might itself, staying in the presence of it, may in fact let us know that there is in fact something beyond this mystic experience of divine luminosity, and that's the one. Wonder whether or not going over this again and again might in fact, therefore, allow my mind, your mind, to prepare not just for this kind of experience, which is certainly a very wondrous kind of experience, but maybe to be open to something beyond it and higher than it. That's what he means by a clear waking vision. That's the goal of the dialectic. I took you through a preliminary exploration of dialectic on the idea of the good to show you the need to assume that there is this thing called the one itself. Right? And in that respect, therefore, I took you through what I wanted to take you through exactly on time. That's Plato's dialectic, and everything I quoted before comes out of the, uh, Jung comes out of the uh, alchemy, psychology and alchemy, and the other volume came out of uh, the practice of psychotherapy. Nearly all of it is in, uh, most of it is in one chapter if you want to get into Carl Jung's dialectic. Um, matter of fact, I can give you all the citations and some people might enjoy it. Um, there are four volumes. And um, 16 is the one I have here. Uh, they're nearly all out of volume 16. There's the major volume. And the other references are volume 7, page 339. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. That's it. You put it all into volume 16. And... Um, I can get you an autographed copy. My daughter autographs them all. <laughs> so, and all of this comes out of Plato's Republic. Everything I said is a quote, except the dialectic. So in this case, the splendor of a vision of, of divine luminosity, would that be the idea of the good? That's what he calls it, because the word idea is Greek, and that's it means to behold. To behold, and yeah. I think last week you referred, you referred to it as kind of the, did you say it was the son of the good or the child of the good? Or yes, the good begotten. Yeah, it, the good begotten. it's called the, the, the good, um, the offspring of the good is offspring. the idea of the good. Right. Yeah, ex, ex, uh, good on it. Yeah, uh, it's an offspring. Yeah, that's what he calls it. Right. In Christian theology, you see the offspring of good, the, the offspring of God becomes the logos. The word. Yeah, the word. Yeah, the word. Yeah. Yeah, anything I can help you with on anything else? I know I jammed a lot through, but I wanted to get it through. I owed it to you from last week. Good, thank you very much. Enjoyed the encounter and the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. <laughs>